Freedom Life Church Online. What's going on? We're excited to have you join us here today. I want to cover a couple of things on how you can stay engaged with us throughout this service. One thing I want you to know about is our chat box. We have hosts that are standing by ready to get to know you. You can take notes and email them to yourself afterwards. Follow along with our Bible, any scriptures that are used. We got live prayer that you can go into a private room and speak with someone privately about any needs that are upon your heart. Our desire is that you feel like the Freedom Life family because that's exactly who you are. So right now, without any further ado, we're excited to see what God has planned today. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much because where your spirit is, there is freedom. Lord, there is freedom, there is joy, there is hope, there is peace. And I pray that we would experience all of that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Freedom Life Church, is anybody ready to join and worship with the heavens today? Just hear you lift up and say, come on.
God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. I will love you, Lord. Scott Chapman is here from Chicago, and um, he's an incredible man of God. He's the man I want to be like when I grow up. He is uh, just from day one. I actually was in Chicago, and you guys know as a church we've been going through a lot. And I just called him up. I said, "Hey, I need to come talk to you." I spent four hours at his table, and we've spent many hours together at his table. He has a word from God that he he just God has put in his heart to share with our church in this season. So I'm going to invite Pastor Scott to come to the stage. Can we give him a huge, awesome Freedom Life Church welcome? Amen. 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 Love you, brother. Love you, too. And if you have never met Pastor Scott, this is my pastor. And uh, and he just, he is, he is my mentor. And I know when he said he had a word from the Lord for our church that, that we need to hear it. So I hope you are ready to receive this morning. So anyway, Amen. Pastor Scott, would you pray for us? Yeah, man. And then just lead us in the word. And then I'll come back afterwards and share a few things with you guys too. Is that cool? All right, let's pray. Awesome. Lord, I am just so thankful for what you are doing in this place. I am thankful for what you are doing in the hearts of the people who are here. And Lord, right now, we actually just pray for more more of the same, more of what you're doing, Lord, more of you. And God, we just right now ask that you would continue to help Freedom Life be a light throughout Hampton, throughout the Tidewater area, Lord, in San Antonio, and honestly, around the world. 
And Lord, we hold this all in your mighty hands. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Ah, it's so good to be with you guys this weekend. It's great to be back. Um, I love being here. I will just tell you, this is, uh, my wife asked me, she said, whenever you travel, you kind of seem very serious, but when you go to Freedom Life, there's kind of this smile on your face. And she said, why is that? I said, I just, I really love these folks, and it is great to be with them. And so, man, I'm just so excited to be with you guys today. You know, I was thinking about our time together, and God kind of reminded me of something that happened to me a few years ago. Um, My buddy and I scored Bears tickets at a night game at Soldier Field, and those are really hard to get. Like, if you're from Chicago, like, it is tough to get. It was a Bears-Packers game at night, and so we were able to get tickets on the 40, which was unbelievable. So we were so excited to go. Like, there were just smiles across our face, right? So we got to the game, we got our food, we found our seat. We're like, man, this is going to be awesome. And right about that time, the weather turned on us. Now, if you're not from Chicago or have never been to Chicago, I should probably understand what I, what I mean by that. And here's what it is. Within like five to ten minutes, the temperature dropped about 20 degrees to about 36. And the wind off of the lake picked up to about maybe, I don't know, 15, 18 miles an hour. And then it started to rain ice cold water that blew sideways in the rain, right? So we were soaked in like 10 minutes. And there was a river of water in Soldier Field running over your feet the entire game because it was raining so hard. So we was actually, it was the coldest I have ever been in my life. And it's the only time I ever hugged a man. And so I was just like, I just had a hold of my buddy and we were just there and was really glad nobody took our picture. But it was, uh, it was an awesome moment. And unfortunately, the game went pretty bad too. The Packers destroyed the Bears. I know, right? Who would have thought that? I mean, really. But so we're leaving the game. It was about 1130 at night. We're freezing cold. We're miserable. It's been a horrible game. And we're kind of just, it's one of these moments, I don't know if you've ever had one of these, like, I can't believe I spent this money. I can't believe I spent this time. I can't believe I did this, right? And we looked at each other and just said, worst Bears game ever. Worst Bears game ever. And so we're walking through this park uh, to get to our car. And we see this Packers fan. We know he's a Packers fan because he has a jersey on and the cheese head. You know what I'm talking about? And he's passed out flat in this park in a puddle. And we were going to do what any Bears fan would do, which would just step over him, right, at, at that point in time. You know? But we're Christians, and we're like, you know, God says love your enemies. And so what, you know, what are you going to do? So I looked at my buddy. I'm like, let's help him out. And so we grab him, try to rouse him. He can't, we can't wake him up. He's dead drunk. And so I just grabbed him under his arms. My buddy grabbed him under his legs. We put the cheese head kind of on his stomach. And we're just kind of walking through this part. And it dawns on me that if a cop sees us, he's going to completely misunderstand what happened, right? You got two Bears fans in jerseys carrying a, you know, unconscious Packers fan. He's not going to believe we're helping him out, right? And so I'm thinking, we got to find a way to get rid of this guy. And so... (laughs) And so we're looking around, and we see this bus, and there's these other Packers fans that are getting on this bus. We're like, let's take them over there. So we take them over, and we drop them, and we say, listen, uh, bus driver, uh, could you take this guy where you're going? He goes, we're going to Green Bay. And I'm like, yes, he's a Green Bay guy. And he goes, no, man. He says, this is a charter bus. Like, no. And I said, come on, man, have a heart. He said, no. Now, it turns out in Chicago, you can get a heart transplant for about 40 bucks these days. (laughs) And so his heart changed, we paid him a little bit of money, and we just threw this guy up in the bus, and he took him. Now, we're walking away, and we felt pretty good about ourselves, like we were good Christians, you know, we did this. And then the thought occurred to us, he might not have even been from Green Bay, right? (laughs) And so we're like, this dude's going to wake up in Green Bay, right? And I'm like, best Bears game ever, right? (laughs) This is awesome. So... (laughs) I laugh, and I tell you, I've thought about that guy. I can't tell you. I've never seen him again, but I've thought about him numerous times and laughed about that. And here's the funny part of that. I think to myself, as he got ready for the game, put his jersey on, got his little cheese, you know, on his head, was getting ready to come, I bet he never dreamt in a million years 
that his greatest hope to get home safely would have been two Bears fans. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> isn't it strange? Hope is a weird thing, isn't it? Hope is a weird thing. You're never entirely certain where it comes from, right? It can come from very unexpected places and unexpected people. Have you ever been surprised by hope any time in your life? Like you're thinking, oh, this is going to be really terrible. And all of a sudden, somebody shows up and it's not so terrible, right? They actually help you out and you're like, man, I wouldn't have thought, and particularly from him, right? Or her. Hope's a big deal, isn't it? Anybody in here need hope? Yeah. I mean, anybody who has kids, right? If you're a parent, <laughs> hope's a big deal, right? I got three kids, man. I need a lot of hope. And, you know, you look at your kids and you think, God, stay in their lives, right? Help them make good decisions. Help them figure out who to be friends with and help them know how to navigate life, right? Because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to come their way that aren't going to have their best heart intentions in mind. So we hope for our kids. We hope for our marriages, don't we? Anybody that says you don't need hope in a marriage has never been married, right? <laughs> like you can be the most loving people with the best marriage in the world. And you're still going to have disagreements, right? You're going to have problems that come in. You're going to see this thing differently. And in that moment when you're sorting through and you maybe feel a little bit alone or misunderstood or even angry, it really helps to say, you know what? I'm confident. I'm confident this is going to pass. I'm confident we're going to be okay. I'm confident we're going to find our way through this. We need confidence in our careers and our jobs. I mean, I'll be honest, man, do you, do you need hope for that? Um, I'll tell you, it's amazing the amount of people that I talk to in our church who thought they had their career path laid out and the economy turned. And it didn't go out and plan the way they thought. And they're like, man, where's the hope in that? You know, we live in a time when I think a lot of people are asking the question, where does hope come from? How can I have hope? How can I feel good about the future? How can I feel good and confident, and not just an empty hope, like a, like a greeting card kind of hope, but a real one? Where can I have hope for my life that I can have the confidence that there's a future for me? Now, as Christians, if somebody comes up and asks us, they say, where is your hope? We would say what? Jesus, that's right. If that was not the answer you were first thinking of, you need to talk to this lady right here, okay, because she got that right. It's Jesus. Our hope as Christians is Jesus. And in fact, that is a big piece of what it means to be a Christian. It's to say, when I look at the world, when I look at my life, when I look at my marriage, when I look at my kids, my confidence and my hope is Jesus. Now, what's interesting is Jesus was teaching and he was teaching, actually, in the Sermon on the Mount, where this huge crowd had gathered around him. And he was kind of explaining what the kingdom of God was like. And the topic kind of had come up of, in a sense, hope. Where does hope come from? And he actually said some things that I don't think I would have imagined him saying. Like, if I could have projected onto Jesus what I thought he would say, this is not it. But this is what he says. This is in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden, and neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. I think there's a little more to that, isn't there? Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> I think I thought I remembered that. I don't know. I, I thought there was a little more to that. So instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, I hear that, and I'm like, wow, Jesus, I would not have expected you to say that. Like, one of the things he says in there is you're the light of the world. Think about that. You are the light of the world. Meaning, like, how is the world going to ever see God, what is good, what is bad, how the world works? And he's saying, it's you. You're the one that's going to illuminate that for the world. i got to be honest with you. 
didn't see that one coming. Because here in other parts of the Bible, we're told that Jesus is the light of the world, right? Now that makes sense to me. I got to be honest with you, that makes sense to me. I mean, one true son of God, savior of the world, king of all creation, yes, light of the world. Death can't hold you, light of the world, right? You are the one that shows us what is right and what is wrong and what is true and what is not and what the future holds for us. You are our hope. You are the one. That makes complete sense to me. When I look at me, it makes no sense, right? I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, don't feel particularly luminary, right? <laughs> like I look at myself and I'm like, I got a lot of weaknesses and sins and brokenness and mess in my life. And when I look at myself, I'm like, Jesus, I couldn't light a birthday cake, let alone the world, man. Like, what are you thinking? Like, let's make you the light of the world, right? That's a good plan. Making me the light of the world, not so much. Here's the challenge, okay? Jesus is stubborn. He is. He's not moving off it. And he says, I don't think you get it, right? Yes, I'm the light of the world, but so are you. There's an identity in that. See, what Jesus is doing is he's conferring an identity on all of us. Now, we might not have asked for that. We're maybe not even comfortable with it or sure what to do with it. But he is. He's saying, let me tell you who you are. This is a who you are question, right? You are the light of the world, he says. And see, what's amazing about that is Jesus is trying to tell us something. See, now he is the light of the world, and when he came into the world, he ushered in his kingdom. And he illuminated the minds of people, meaning people saw things differently. One of my favorite things when you read stories about people who met Jesus, right, that they come thinking one way and they leave thinking another. Isn't that true? Something happens in this short period of time to where all of a sudden, they see the world differently. They see God differently. They see him differently. They see themselves differently. And they might not have it all figured out, but they're not where they were. We also see radically imperfect people, prostitutes, tax collectors, folks nobody likes, right? Coming near to Jesus, and we find out that not only he likes them, he loves them. And he transforms their lives. Like, they leave different. They're not just thinking differently, like they are different. And Jesus wasn't satisfied with just individual transformation. He came to change the world. He came to change the way the world works. He spoke truth to power. Just so we're clear, that's why they killed him. It's not because he did nice things for people. He came to establish a totally different way that the world should work. He came as a king with a different way. See, that's Jesus. And the Bible says one day his kingdom, when he returns, is going to fill the earth. And there's not going to be any more death. <laughs> there's not going to be any more sin. There's not going to be any more strife and conflict. It's gone. But even now, that very kingdom that one day will fill the earth can fill you. How amazing is that? See, everybody that says yes to Jesus, that follows him and says, I want to be like you. I want you to be my king. I want you to be my savior. We're told that we receive the very presence of God, that the Holy Spirit becomes part of who we are, that the very presence of God dwells within us. That's a huge deal. What Jesus is kind of saying is, between the time that I ascended into heaven and that I come back in return, you are the light of the world. You are how God is present. See, we don't have a temple in Jerusalem anymore. There's not a, uh, an ark that's traveling around in the desert. If you want to experience the presence of God, people need to experience you. Because we are the light of the world. That's what that means. And you see, if people want to experience Jesus' kingdom in a different way of life, we're how they do that. And if his kingdom is going to go forward instead of backward in the time that he's gone, we're the ones. Because we 
are the light of the world. How amazing is that? I don't know how you saw your identity prior to this moment, but there's lots of people that want to tell you who you are. There's lots of people who want to limit you and tell you that you're very small or very insignificant or very unimportant. They're wrong. They're wrong. When God looks down from heaven at Hampton, you are the most important people that he sees. Because you are the light of the world. Do you ever see one of those satellite pictures at night, right? And the, all the lights that kind of pop up in their cities and it's kind of cool, right? I think spiritually that's true too. Amen. And I think every one of you are one of those lights. And when God looks down, that's what he sees in the midst of a sinful darkness. He sees you. Well, he goes on to say not only is there an identity, but there's a calling. It's like, I want you to do something with that light, by the way. Here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to let it shine before others so they can see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's called a witness. He said, I want you to have a witness. And so often when we hear the word witness, we think, well, we've got to know something about the Bible to tell people, like we've got to be able to tell them what the Bible says. That's actually not what it means. It means that you're an eyewitness. If there was a crime somewhere in Hampton, right, which I'm not sure there ever is, but I know in Chicago we have a lot of those, right? The police are not looking for someone who has, like, Googled some interesting fact, right? They're looking for somebody who actually saw something. We're actually called to not just be people of information, but people of experience of God. People who live with God. People who know God, right? People who are walking with God so that we have a witness of God. And he says how we live really matters. See, each of us is to live like Jesus and continue his ministry until he returns. That's a big deal, isn't it? You know, Jesus said something that I think is outrageous. He says, he says a lot of outrageous things, right? Like he says things I would never have the guts to say. But he seems fine with it. He says, you and me, get this. If you thought light of the world would blow you away. He says, you and me are actually going to do greater things than he did. What's up with that, right? <laughs> See, here's the thing. Individually, I don't know that I am. Like, I don't know that I'm going to do greater things than Jesus as an individual. And I'm not sure that's what he meant. But collectively, when you have a thousand people carrying the presence of God instead of one or a million that can be in a million places and involved in 10 or 20 million people's lives at the same time, together we actually can do things that are even greater than what Jesus did on earth because we are the light of the world. And when we let our light shine, people will praise our Father in heaven. What that basically means is live in such a way that people will look at you and say you are different, but different in a good way. Amen. I'm not sure why, but I want to know. And as they ask, we have the best answer in the world. Jesus. Yes. That's why I'm different. You know, I don't know about you, but not only am I insecure about like my life being the light of the world, I'm also insecure at my ability to do this thing. Like, I don't know about you, but there's times when Darkness looks pretty daunting. You ever been in a moment like that? Like, I'm not sure the good kid's going to win this one, right? Like, this looks pretty big, pretty strong, pretty scary. Like, these people look pretty committed to evil to me. You know? It's not like I'm going to talk them out of that. I'm not sure how this is going to work for us. Um, but there's something in this that we need to get. And here's what it is. If you've ever felt that way... Um, I don't know about you, but I love sleeping in a completely dark room. Anybody else? Completely dark room? Yes. Thank you. Right? I do not like light when I sleep. In my hotel room that I was staying in this weekend, 
got all the lights off, pulled the curtains, got everything ready. Awesome. Total darkness. You know, stumbled my way into bed, went to sleep. About 6, 10 in the morning, I realized the curtain was a little shorter than the window, okay? <laughs> and this beam of light hits me in the face, right, as I come in, and I'm like, oh, man. And so I couldn't fix it, and so I'm like, okay, so I'm going to get up. And as I was in the shower and I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, isn't it interesting that darkness doesn't go to the outside, but that light comes in? Because light is greater than darkness. You see, the darkness in our world, the people who hold power for bad reasons, the systems that are in place that don't empower people, to be their greater and best self, want to scare us to death. And they want us to believe that that is greater than God. But here's the truth. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? When you show up, I don't know if you realize this or not, you are the most dangerous person to evil on the planet. You are. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You should not fear demons. They should fear you. Because you carry the very presence of God. You are a walking tabernacle of the Lord. You are the light of the world. And when you shine that light before men, Jesus actually says what? The world will change. You are a world changer. Well, Jesus also in this not only has an identity that he confers and a calling that he tells us about, but he also throws a warning down. And this is what he says. It's actually at the very beginning. He kind of warns us first. He says there's a temptation you're going to face, right? Like when you do the light of the world thing, there's a temptation coming that you're going to face. And I just want to kind of tell you about it ahead of time, he says. And he puts it this way. He says, not only are you the light of the world, he says, you're the salt of the earth. Thanks, Jesus. That's awesome, right? I've always wanted to be the salt of the earth. And he says, well, here's the deal, though. If salt loses its saltiness, it no longer has any value. It's not valuable anymore. And all you really do is throw it on the ground and walk on it. Now, see, that's kind of confusing. And at first glance, that's hard to understand what he means. And I think part of the reason is we don't have a clear understanding of how people in Jesus' day used salt. They used it very differently than we do. First of all, salt wasn't just sodium chloride, the white stuff that's in there. It was minerals, right? It was all kinds of salts. And they didn't just, they did season their food, but that wasn't the main thing that they did. They, didn't, they also used it sometimes to preserve meat, but that wasn't the main thing that they did. What they would do is they'd actually put it in the ground to grow crops. See, they lived in a dry and arid place where the dirt wasn't very good, right? We live in a place where the dirt's really good, so you don't have to do that. But they would have two kinds of dirt. If you talk to a farmer in Jesus' day, he would tell you about two kinds of soil. Salty soil, where you grow things, right? And dirt that just kind of covers the earth. And he, the idea is this. When the soil that you're planting in, the salty soil, ceases to be salty, what is it? It's dirt. What do you do with dirt? You walk on it. It doesn't have value for planting your crops anymore, meaning things don't grow in it. Okay? So what is Jesus' point? He says, when the salty soil loses its saltiness, right, when the plants suck all the minerals out of the dirt, it's just dirt like everything else. Another way to say it really plainly might be this. When the people of Jesus, the salty soil, right, stop living like Jesus and start living like the world, they aren't salty anymore. They're like everybody else. And they no longer have a witness. They're not special. They're not different. And the people of the world don't take notice of them anymore. They just walk over them. That's it. 
can I tell you, this is a challenge for us today. It's a challenge for us. We live in a time when the world has grown very important. And we're tempted to believe that Jesus is kind of the king of our spiritual life and maybe our afterlife. But the rest of our life we get from the world. Like Jesus is kind of the Lord of the, of the Sabbath. But the rest of the week we seek our life, our provision, our blessing, our goodness from the world. And when we do that, we shrink Jesus to something he was never intended to be. He's not just king of the Sabbath or king of your afterlife. He's king, period. Come on, come on. He is king of everything. And when we realize that, we realize that he is actually where life comes from. But the temptation that we face is to give so much away that we become like everyone else. And we have no witness. I was in Boston a few years ago. I flew in. Uh, I was doing a video thing there. And I got in super late. And I, about probably 12.30. And I zipped to my hotel. And I checked in. And they said, hey, uh, we do have your reservation. We didn't think you were coming. And so we gave your room away. Awesome. <laughs> right? They said, tell you what we'll do. There's another hotel, really nice hotel. Like, this was a Marriott courtyard. They said, a real Marriott across the river, we'll get you a room there. Upgrade. Awesome, right? So I drive over there, and I get there, and they go, yeah, here's the thing. The guy that told them that was wrong. And so there's no room here either. And I'm like, man, you got to help me out. And so I started to talk to the guy behind the desk. He was a really nice guy. It turns out he was a Christian. And he said, what are you doing here? So I told him I was doing this, this video shoot for our church, and and he's like, wow. He goes, you know what? He goes, I'm actually not supposed to do this. But we do have one room available. It's the presidential suite. He goes, would you like it? Yes, yes, I would. <laughs> and so they take me up. I mean, I'm like in jeans. I got a little duffel bag. And I walk into this thing. It's a house, okay? It's not a room. It's like 3,000 square feet. I'm not kidding. There's a full kitchen, a full dining room with presidential china. Like when he says presidential, he means like presidents of the United States stay there when they're in Boston. Heads of state from other countries. I mean, it had amazing furniture. I'm taking pictures, you know, of everything around, you know. And I didn't want, it was like 1.30 in the morning. I didn't even want to go to bed because I'm enjoying the presidential suite, right? I had this little gold cup I put Diet Coke in. I don't know if I should have done that or not, but I'm like, you know, absolutely, you know. So I'm, I'm living this up, and I'm like, man, God, you are awesome. This is an incredible blessing. So I'm finally I'm like, I do have to get some sleep. So I go in the presidential bedroom, which was equally awesome. And I go in, and I get in bed, and I go to sleep. About two hours or so later, I wake up, and I have this weird feeling. Like I feel itchy, and I'm like, ah, what is that, right? And my pillow's moving. And so I think I'm imagining it. And so I get up and I turn the lights on. And I look at the pillow and it's moving. And there are spiders everywhere. I have, I'm like, you know, getting them off. They're in the bed. There's thousands of them in this pillow. There's a nest. And they hatched. And they're coming out. And so I did what any good Ohio boy would do. I grabbed and shut the pillow and, you know, pounded them, you know, killing as many of them as I can possibly kill. Well, I call down the front desk, and I'm like, hey, man, I got a problem. And I tell them what it is, and so they come up, and they change all the bedding. They clean the room. They vacuum it. They wipe it down. They do everything they're supposed to do. And they say, listen, Mr. Chapman, there's no more spiders. We got them. So sorry. You can go back to sleep now. That fits into the easier said than done category. Let me just tell you. And I laid there all night with imaginary spiders, right, <laughs> all over me, all over the bed, all over everything else. And I share that with you for this reason. You can be in an opulent place. Like, you can be blessed beyond all reason. Like, to the point where you can't even experience it all. It is so good. And one little thing, little itty-bitty spider can ruin it all, 
can mess it up for you that it's no good to you anymore. This is exactly what Jesus meant. The kingdom of God is way better than that presidential suite. The kingdom of God is life. The kingdom of God is the presence of the one true almighty God. The kingdom of God is power. The kingdom of God is goodness. And when you walk in the kingdom of God, there is nothing like it. When you have known God, there's nothing, and I mean nothing, that compares to that. But, but, when there's one little thing like living for the world instead of Jesus, it's like that spider. And it messes the whole thing up. And it's no more fun for you or anybody else you invite into that room. That's exactly what he meant. That's exactly what he meant. See, here's the thing. When you think about this notion, man, of being the light of the world, wow. What identity are you ever going to get that's greater than that? You are the light of the world. And you have a calling. Like God thought about you and has told you this is what he wants you to do. To let your light shine before the people around you. So that they will know him. Can I tell you, we are called to be people of the presence. Right? We are called to be people who know how to enter into the presence of God and carry it. We are people of prayer. We are people of worship. We are people who don't just on a Sunday morning, but all seven days of the week, we have learned how to carry the presence of God. We are people of the presence. We are also people of blessing. We are people who are going to be blessed by God. How many people have been blessed by God? Anybody know? Yeah. God is a generous God. And the idea is that he blesses us. And he gives us more than we need. When Jesus talks about the abundant light, that's exactly what he means. Specifically, let me get really specific. More of everything than you need. More of finances, sure, but also more of the kingdom of God than you need. Why would he do that? Is it just to show how extravagant he is? No. Because he expects you to give it away. He expects you to... To actually be able to figure out how to give away everything that he is giving because he's not going to stop giving. When we become confident in the Lord's provision, financially for sure, but also the entire kingdom, that his presence, that his goodness, that his power is going to continue to come into our life, we can give it away without fear of loss. See, when we have a posture like this and we're trying to be blessed by God and we're saying just a little more, a little more, right? I can hold it all. At some point, we're defeating what God is trying to do. But when our posture is this, man, we can continue to receive, 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 receive. So we're people of the presence, we're people of blessing, and we're also people of invitation. We're the walking, talking invitation of God. Every single person in your neighborhood, every single person in your school, Every single person in your workplace, God loves. And they're never going to know it. They are never going to know it if we don't tell them. You are people of invitation. God is calling you and me to actually let them know that the blessings and the goodness of God isn't just for some select group of people. It's for everybody. Because he loves everybody. We're the people of the presence, we're the people of blessing, we're the people of invitation. That's what it means to be the light of the world. That when we show up, we've actually prayed the presence of God into a place. We're prepared to bless every single person around us, regardless of who they are, even if we like them. Even if they're our in-laws, right? No matter who this is, even if they're a Packers fan, right? We're going to help them. And we're people of invitation. Because when people have experienced the presence of God and have been blessed by God, Through us, an invitation makes sense. 
when we have not taken time to be the people of the presence and we have chosen to not bless, an invitation might be the worst thing we could do. There's a passage of scripture I want to share with you. 2 Chronicles 16.9, and uh, you may not have heard of it. It's actually my life verse. It's the, it's the verse our church was planted on. And it goes like this. It says, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to, to um, looking for anyone whose heart is fully committed to him so that he might strongly support them. Let me tell you what that means. It means, here's the good news of that. You don't have to look for God. He's looking for you. Every day, he's looking over the entire earth, and he's looking for one kind of person, somebody whose heart is his. And he says, when I find them, like he knows exactly what to do with them, he throws the full support of heaven behind them. You won't have to find God. He's going to find you. And you're not going to have to wonder if he's going to get behind you or not. He is, if you're willing to give your heart fully to him, to be a person of the presence, to be a person of the blessing, to be a person of invitation. Can I just tell you, if the people in this room, just, just us, just this room, owned that for 12 months, what would happen? How would Hampton change? How would your neighborhood change? How would your family change? How would your school change? How would where you work change? If we did not get tired of doing what is good, but we trusted that the presence of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, and the power of the Lord is on us, and that we are actually the light of the world. I got to tell you something. I believe in you. I really do. I love you. I love coming here. Because when I do, when I experience you, it's kind of like a taste of Jesus. I know it's weird, but it is. I experience Jesus through you every single time I'm around you. That is special, by the way. This is a special place. You have godly leaders. God is at work here. But as confident as I am in that, that is not where my confidence rests. My confidence rests in the Lord and the promises that he has given us. Amen? And so what I want to do is I just want to end our time with a moment of invitation. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I want you to think right now. Just take a minute before the Lord, if you're willing, and think through what is it that keeps you from doing exactly what we've talked about. What is holding you back from being the light of the world where you are? Is it busyness? Lack of margin? Is it fear? Is it maybe that people have told you other things and there's a competing identity that you're not sure whether you can really trust who Jesus says you are? Are you afraid of the darkness that you think, gosh, it's pretty scary, and if I do, there could be rejection involved in this for me? Is it that you really wonder, can I really count on God? What is it for you? And in that moment, I want to just call this out to you. And I want to say, as we process this right now, I want you to ask that question. What is standing in the way of releasing the full power of God in this church into the community? Because my friends, that would be worth living for. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the goodness that you show, and we thank you for how you lead us. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would give us a vision for what you want and for how we can move forward with you. God, we ask that you would help us to navigate our weakness and our fears and our doubts. Lord, you knew we'd have them. Walk through them with us, God. 
Order our world. Bring the people that you want in front of us. And God, help us to be in Hampton the light of the world. Amen. 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 Can we just thank God for the, the word, Pastor Stefan? Amen. 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 Why don't we stand together? Can we just stand together and prepare our hearts to respond to God's word? You know, we, we believe that, that it is the word of God that leads to faith and faith leads to action. And I just want to lean further into what Pastor Scott just said. If you don't mind, if you're a prayer partner, just making yourself available. You know, in moments like this, we decide how we respond to the stirring that God's put in our heart. And I would just love for you to consider, what, what is the one decision? What is the one place? I, I absolutely believe that in moments like this, we can be one decision away from a radically different future. One moment, one invitation. Sometimes we don't have the words. Sometimes we don't know how to navigate that. Sometimes we just need someone to come alongside of us. And that's why our prayer partners are here. That's why they're available. Maybe you don't even know how to pray to say, look, I'm experiencing a love I've never felt before. And I would just love for someone to tell me what this is. His name is Jesus. And if you've never just said yes to his love, you could just do that right now. If Maybe you've got a, a spider nest in, in your room. And you know that. And you say, you know, there's this thing in my life. And I've been wrestling with it. I've been fighting with it. And even when I think it's gone, sometimes I still feel the itch for it. And maybe that's you and you say, I believe that God's word says I can actually be delivered from that. And maybe I just need somebody to pray with me for some deliverance today. We started this church 14 years ago on a belief that Jesus came to set captives free. Bring recovery of sight to the blind. To heal the brokenhearted, to deliver those that are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I believe in moments like this is when that happens. So if you're here today, we're going to worship, and we're going to make declaration that the Lord is in fact our salvation. He is the one who rescues us. That the Lord himself, he is the one. And so while we worship God, if you have anything you need prayer for, if you need us to step into a moment with you, I want to ask you to do that right now. So I'm just going to pray for us. And as we worship God, if you need prayer, I'm going to invite you, don't stay where you are. Let God meet you in this moment. Father, right now in Jesus' name, all around this room, Holy Spirit, we invite heaven. We invite your word. We invite your presence. We invite your power. Lord, right now, would we make a decision to leave here different than we showed up in Jesus' name? Come on, let's worship God. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? I 
I will see the goodness of the Lord. 